Muslims teach that Sharia law overrides all other law systems, that everyone is required to obey it and can be enforced by violence if necessary. It's important for you to understand what that implies, but you're not going to like it. We've covered a number of aspects of Sharia, its secrecy, for instance, and uh, we talked last time about its, uh, you know, initial developments. In fact, I think we called it uh, from Arab um, uh, legal culture to Talmud. But today we'll continue with that theme, obviously, and with me here uh, to do this amazing job, our dear brother Lloyd de Jong. Lloyd, thank you so much, brother, for what you do, and thank you for your uh, detailed explanations. It's even more detailed than the Quranic detailed explanation, if I may add. So go ahead, brother. Uh, continue with your uh, explanations of Sharia in a way that I think it's going to be extremely powerful and educational and informative to anyone watching this series. Thank you, Alfani. Very honored. Right, so this series, well, this slide is entitled Christianity is Abrogated, It is Replaced. Now, this is in the Islamic law, the Sharia, and you'll see here, this is in the Reliance of the Traveler, which I showed previously. This is the finality of the Prophet's message, section W4.0, and it states here, this section has been translated to clarify possible confusions among Muslims as to Islam's place amongst world religions. Now, of course, there's lots of back and forth, many opinions. However, the, we are now working with what is called the ijma, the consensus of the scholars, the final interpretation of the scholars to the final position. This is the orthodox position of Islam across all the four schools. And it states here, previously revealed religions were valid in their own eras, but were abrogated by the universal message of Islam, as is equally attested by many verses of the Quran. Both points are worthy of attention that one, Christianity, Judaism, other religions were valid before, but they were canceled, they were abrogated by Islam. And this is worthy of attention from English-speaking Muslims who are occasionally exposed to erroneous theories advanced by some teachers and Quran translators. So in other words, now, what this means is, in practice, that Christianity is viewed as Deen al batl Islam is Deen al-Haq, the religion of truth. Now, that's, there are many words that can describe that. I'll just pause there for that. But we are Deen al batl al batl is the false, the vain, the void religion, the worthless religion. When void, we speak, obsolete, we pray, you know, not valid, expired, you know, if you want to correct. that. Yeah. So, basically, when we pray, our words fall like dust at our feet. Allah does not listen to us. And Islam is the Deen al Haq, the religion of truth, the religion of, well, 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 we'll explain as we go. And also, battle is also one of the names of Satan. So, therefore, Christianity, according to Islamic law, is also the religion, the false religion of Satan. That is according to the orthodox position within the Sharia. Now, affirming these religions' validity, right, so this is continuing from the previous slide. Erroneous theories advanced by some teachers and Quran translators affirming these religions' validity but denying or not mentioning their abrogation, or that his unbelief, it is kufr to hold that the remnant cults now bearing the names of formerly valid religions, such as Christianity or Judaism, are acceptable to Allah after he sent the final messenger to the entire world. This is a matter over which there is no disagreement among Islamic scholars. If an English-speaking Muslim at times discuss it as if there were some question, the only reason is that no one has yet offered them a translation of a scholarly Quranic exegesis, a tafsir, to explain the accord between the various Quranic verses and their agreement with the Sunnah. Islam is the final religion that Allah Most High will never lessen or abrogate. Your yes. Thoughts on Fadi? No, I mean, it's it's just fascinating because when I, when I tell people that, uh, you know, the Quran itself says, in the deen Allah al-Islam. Uh, it also says, uh, uh, It will not be accepted. You know, only Islam is the religion of Allah. When you say things like this, you know, you have some Muslims say, no, 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 no. Everyone is going to make it to heaven and you'll be judged according to your works. And I don't know where they get this idea from. The Quran is very clear about it. We will cover all of that as we go through all of this. I'm just laying a foundation, introducing this material, and we will go into some great depth as we go forward. Now, let's take from Quran to Hadith to doctrine, 
and then law. Let's have a look at how the Quran and Hadith end up as doctrine and law. This is the Quran here. You already have had you have already had a fair example in Abraham and the ones with him as they said to their people, surely we are completely quit of you. And whatever you worship apart from Allah, we disbelieve in you and between you and us, enmity, hostility, hatred, ill will, animosity, antagonism. That is the meaning of enmity has appeared. And abhorrence, extreme repugnance, loathing, abomination. These are very nasty words to describe people with. So enmity has appeared and abhorrence forever until you believe in Allah alone. And of course, Muslims believe in Allah, Christians do not. Therefore, they must treat us with enmity and abhorrence. Indeed, I will definitely ask for forgiveness for you. In no way do I possess anything for you from Allah. So this is the Dr. Khali translation, Quran 64. Now, let's have a look at the doctrine of al-wala wal-bara, disassociation and enmity or loyalty and disavowal, how this has now translated into doctrine. After loving Allah and his messenger, Allah obligates us to love those who love Allah and his messenger and hate those who oppose Allah and his messenger. So by default, Muslims are required by doctrine to hate non-Muslims. The Islamic belief system, the Aqidah, obligates every Muslim to love the people of Tawheed, the Muslims, and hate the people of Shirk. So this is a God who teaches hatred, according to the official doctrine of Islam. This obligation comes from the creed of Abraham, the creed we are ordered to follow. So according to Islamic law and according to Islamic doctrine, Abraham, Abraham of the Bible, has taught the Muslims to hate Jews and hate Christians. Right. And, and this doctrine, al-wala wal-bara, by the way, is a big deal because many of those uh, who joined al-Qaeda, for instance, or are jihadis, uh, they adhere to this doctrine, basically leaving everything behind for the sake of Allah. Correct. So now let's have a quick look at what the Encyclopedia of Islam tells us about this. It says here, those who died after spending their lives waging war against the appetite of soul, the nafs, were regarded as martyrs. So those who died, so you can die as a martyr if you die in jihad, killing or being killed for Allah. Notice it says here, even if he dies in his own bed, he is a shahid who will be treated as if he had been killed fighting alongside the prophet. Okay, fine. So you can be treated as a martyr, as a shahid, who with the same honors as someone who died in jihad, even if you die in your own bed. Other imami traditions declare as martyrs those who in their lifetime practiced muddarat, i.e. those who treated others in a friendly manner while concealing their true attitude towards them. Now, muddarat is the Sunni word which everyone knows as takia. They claim it is a Shia practice. However, if you look for muddarat through the Sunni Islamic sources, you will barely find this word. They simply call it takia as well. So you will die as a martyr for lying about your, well, for lying towards others, treating them as if they are your friends, but actually hating them in your heart. This will make you die as a martyr in Islam. Right. Fascinating. Fascinating. Thank you for sharing that. Um, carry on, brother. No, you know, we still have time uh, uh, to cover even more. Certainly. Okay. So now let's look at Islam's two purposes and let's look at two critical verses of the Quran. And then these will be expressed in doctrine and law as we go forward. Quran 4, 157, Islam's religious purpose. They said in boast, we killed Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah, but they killed him not, nor crucified him. Of a surety, they killed him not. On this basis, Islam rejects and seeks to correct the gospel, i.e. the crucifixion, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. And also, once you go into the seerah, you will see that they replace Jesus with Muhammad. Within the seerah, Muhammad is deified. Muhammad becomes a god within the seerah. Then you go to Quran 3, 104, Islam's political purpose. This is the fundamental doctrine of Islam. It's called commanding the right and forbidding the wrong. We will go into depth in this in the future. Let there arise out of you a group of people inviting to all that is good, enjoining what is right and forbidding what is wrong. Understand good as defined by the Sharia, not by your internal moral sense, and enjoining what is right and forbidding what is wrong as defined by the Sharia. Commanding the right and forbidding the wrong is the fundamental doctrine of Islam. It guides the Ummah's socio-political behavior and agenda. And if you're not a Muslim, unfortunately, Sharia is binding upon you. This, enjoining what is right, in other words, obliging everyone to do what is considered right under the Sharia and forbidding you from doing anything that goes against the Sharia, well, Sharia is binding upon non-Muslims too, so Muslims must, one way or another, make us follow the Sharia. 
Absolutely. And of course, this is where you get Hayat al Amr bil Ma'roof and Nahi an al Munkar. The religious uh, police authority, for instance, is to enforce the what is a virtue and also go after those who do a vice. Um, uh, so the, all of that comes from there. Correct. And we will see that within the law. We will actually have a look at that within the law. Uh, how much time do we have, Al Fadi? I think we have about maybe a minute or two. So if you want to wrap up this one and we'll pick it up next time, that will be great. Okay, so let me go here. Let me have a brief look at commanding the right and forbidding the wrong. Let me show you, this is commanding the right and forbidding the wrong within the Sharia, within the uh, Umdat al-Salik. Let's have a quick look here. This is the, this is the, Rule and well, this is just the title headings, right? The chapter headings. You must have knowledge of the wrong act. You need to explain that something is wrong to the non-Muslim or the Muslim. Then you must forbid the act verbally. You need to say something. Within this, if that is not sufficient, you need to censure with harsh words. In other words, insult. Use vile, harsh, abusive language. This is legal. Then you must write the wrong by hand. Now, you can figure out for yourself what it is to write something by hand, then to use intimidation, then assault, then force of arms. Intimidation, so hit them first, then intimidate them, then assault them. This means use of weapons. And if that is not sufficient, go get some friends and bring weapons. This is what commanding the right and forbidding the wrong entails. This is not religious. This is entirely gang warfare and political. Absolutely. I mean, I like uh, your mention of uh, writing the wrong by hand. What in the world does that mean? Fighting, wrestling, slapping? I mean, uh, you, you get the idea, folks. Breaking. I mean, it's very clear, you know, very clear what's going on here. And uh, and this is in one of the most reputable Sharia law, basically, uh, uh, collections, if you wish, or a ruling book, uh, you know, Umdat al-Salik or the Reliance of the Travelers. And it is based on the Shafi'i school, if uh, if my memory serves me correct here. Cool. Yeah, very good. Yes. Well, thank you, brother. And, uh, you know, what should people expect next time, uh, just to as a, a way of a teaser here? I will go through some statistics on the Muslims. So, of course, these statistics are very, well, We'll have a look at the Akida, the Islamic creed, and we'll okay. continue as we're going, just talking about laws, talking about doctrine, and talking about how these are applied and how we can see these in the actions of Muslims. Wonderful. You heard the man. We hope to see you next time. This is Al-Fadi, over and out. God bless. Take care. Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to like and subscribe to our channel, Sira International, and click on the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we publish a new video or go live. I would also like to appeal to you to consider becoming a Patreon patron by clicking the link right below. By doing so, you can give towards the production of these videos. There are also other options for you where you can give to our channel. I thank you from the bottom of my heart.